G'day fans, and we're back talking about The Mandalorian. It's the end of the second season, and holy guacamole, how good was all that? Who cared about the rest of the episode? It was only the last couple of minutes that people really went, oh, oh my God, fans were just losing everything. It was bits popping up everywhere. It was like, oh, 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 oh. the internet almost broke. Holy guacamole, what can I say? So it's uh, Dags and MPS with you today. We're talking about The Rescue. MPS, mate, what did you think of The Rescue? Oh, I think the rescue was what we needed to rescue most of the rest of the series. <laughs> so I think, uh, um, to be honest, if all the eps were like this one, the series would have been over the top. It would have yeah. been unreal and it would have been great. But uh, yeah, let's get into it because there's a lot to talk about. Indeed. Um, I really like the start, uh, the slave one chasing the, the shuttle. I thought that was really, really good. Uh, Dr. Pershing still uh, pops up again, still wearing glasses. You know, there's still glasses in there. You know, like, they haven't got <laughs> special contact lenses, but now he's still wearing the old uh, Ray-Bans, which is kind of cool. Uh, and I actually did like the fact that after they captured him, he just says, oh, I'll tell you everything you need to know about Gideon's ship. <laughs> Don't you worry about that. No, yeah, this is here and that. This one goes there. That one goes there. <laughs> like, oh, Jesus Christ. Um, I, I really did like, the moment when they get on the ship and he's got the gun to Pershing's head. And this really introduced that concept that a lot of people have sort of thought about, but haven't really discussed because it's almost a very sensitive topic about the suggestion that um, the Rebel Alliance, you know, when it, this is from the original Star Wars, had become a terrorist organisation. So the Empire effectively was the government and the Alliance was classed as a terrorist group. And of course, when they blew up the Death Star, which they reference in this episode, that was the equivalent of saying, oh, okay, the terrorists have blown up a government building, depending on your perspective. Now, of course, from the audience's perspective, we say, oh, the Empire, the bad guys, the Alliance are the good guys. But if you're an in-universe character who's just standing on the periphery and you don't really know about anything, uh, you could say, oh, yeah, what's the deal with these dudes? Uh, and even though it's, it's very sensitive, it was good that that guy with the gun and to Pershing's head actually brought that up. And I thought that was actually kind of cool. So, but, uh, and the fact that he saw Alderaan get destroyed and all the rest of it. So, you know, had to put that little evil touch moment in there, but uh, what do you think of all that? Yeah. Once they boarded the, um, the shuttle, it became very intense, you know, because you think to yourself, oh yeah, these guys are just, you know, low level pilots, yep. blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden this guy goes, no, I got him here. Yep. And the other guy goes, I'll tell you anything you want. He goes, oh, bang, you're gone. Yep. Yep. And it's like, oh, hang on. This could end very, very badly. And then he starts taunting Kara by saying, you know, I was on the Death Star. And then she threw back with, like, which one? Yeah. Because, you know, obviously. So, you know, and then it was very clever, the fact that they referenced all of this stuff. You know, it could have worked. And when she goes, which one? And he goes, oh. Was there more than one, was there? Because not like everybody happened to know that there was two of them. You know, I think it could have been like a, the world kept secret or something. <laughs> but anyway, it Which, worked very, very well. It was a nice moment because you're right. They could have just walked in and blown everybody to, peep, uh, to pieces, captured Pershing and away you go. But uh, but we get down to the planet in the bar. And I must admit the imagery of the two guys, you know, you got Din and you got Boba walking in the side by side. And I go, yeah, that and the camera operator and the, and the cinematographer said, oh, this is going to look awesome. Right. We've always had just one dude walking into the bar, the old ching, 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 you know, the piano player stops playing. Now you've got two of them and that looked grouse, right? I think, how cool is that? But then we turn over and we see uh, Korska and um, Bo-Katan and they're thinking, oh, you've already had two Mandalorians walking into the bar. So it's like, okay, we've been there, done that. It's like, oh, it's just more, there's just more Mandalorians. So that moment's kind of a bit ruined. And of course, where's the third guy? He's just buggered off. He's just not around. And fans are saying, well, maybe he was in the little Mando's room, as you were, as it were, when all this is going down. And then, of course, they all bugger off to go and rescue Gogu. And he comes back out and goes, you know, does up his fly and goes, oh, I am wondering, where did everybody go? <laughs> He's just <laughs> out of the picture completely. So what did you make of all that whole sequence there, old son? The, yeah, the cinematography from when they walked in, it was almost like that was the standard walk for a Mandalorian. Yep. You walk in, you look around. You see what you're after, yep. and you, you just walk forward. So I thought that was that was fantastic. You needed um, to go up to the bar to the to the, the bartender and say, "I want a jar of juice and give it to me in a dirty cup." <laughs> <laughs> and, and he just sw swishes it across the bar, and you just go, Whoosh, "Bang!" <laughs> bang. He, goes, he goes, goes as he grabs, he goes, "I need a straw." <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the bendy one that goes under the helmet. <laughs> <laughs> it goes, "I want one of those right. too." Um, I thought it was good that the... Get a curly the, straw. <laughs> That's the shape of a helmet. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, it's been a late time for us. <laughs> anyway, move on. Uh, it was interesting to see that Bo-Katan wasn't interested in Fett at all. 
Yeah. And to then bring out, you know, you're not a real Mandalorian, you're not a this. And you, but then hang on a second, neither is Din. It just seems like what we've been thinking for years has actually been written down because, you know, John Favreau is a very big fan of, of Star Wars and everything. And finally, we're getting some of those questions that we've always had and discussed yep. ourselves in canon, which yep. was really, really good. Um, then to see um, Fett and, and the other Oscar. one go for it and have that, that yep. mini fight, it was like, and as Bo-Katan said, if you guys had shown that even half of that yep. when we were fighting yep. the, the, the Empire... We wouldn't have lost Mandalore. And I was like, oh yeah, it's a tough call that one. Yeah, that's always been the problem with the whole Mandalorian culture. That all the all the different groups always been fighting themselves, and uh, like they even make a reference to the Mandalorian Civil War. I think it might have been in the last episode or an episode before that. Uh, but that was good because on screen we don't necessarily get to see Mandalorians fighting each other, and that was a really good moment. They're smashing tables and bashing each other up and all the rest of it, and they're like using like flamethrowers and all this sort of bizzo. And that was really good. It's like, okay, how is this going to play out? And it was good that Bo-Katan eventually said, hey, knock it off. And yeah, it's almost like, they're almost like a Mandalorian version of the Sith because the Sith effectively destroyed themselves because they just had this power ego thing going on. And the Mandalorians are clearly in the same boat. So by by default, they sort of very, very self-destructive sort of race and people, which is kind of funny. But, you know, they get their differences out of the way. They get on the ship and they, and they work out the plan. It's like, we get to see the whole plan. It's like, there you go, here you go, there you press this, you do that. It's like, oh, holy guacamole, you know, Pershing helps him, helps him with that. So, yeah. and then we go, all right, they're straight to Gideon's ship. We know where it is. Let's get into the next part of the story where things really start to pick up. And I've got to say, I love this the sequence where the um, uh, the shuttle crashes into the into the ship. That was so well yeah. done. And did you pick up? And you would have picked up that, like when the Tie Fighters are launching out of the ship. It's like that's out of Battlestar Galactica, you know, yep. you know <laughs> it's like coming to the camera and all this sort of thing. It's like, oh, and of course with Katie Sackhoff, who worked on Battlestar Galactica, she'd be thinking, oh, we got this again. Oh, yeah, I used to fly one of those. <laughs> what do you think of all that? Yeah, look, there's there was that sequence, and there was another sequence with the uh, the dark troopers, which we'll get to shortly. Yep. Um, that there was a few references thrown in that were other sci-fi references. Uh, normally, the tie fighters would have just dropped out from underneath yep. the yep. ships and everything. This was specific, and yeah, they did thrust back. And yep. yeah, as soon as I saw that, I went, "Oh, come on, guys, Battlestar Galactica." Yeah, it was a bit. Apart from the fact that that's right? awesome, you know, but which also meant that only two two or three fighters came out that FET could deal with um, and, and go from there. So, but it was interesting because there was no sort of, you know, abort, abort sort of, you know, mm. don't let the shuttle land in there and everything. And they just did. So it was like, and you're only being attacked by one ship. So it couldn't have been that bad, really. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, but the shuttles are sort of defenseless. So, you know, they were, they were playing defensive yep. and they flew in and they crashed. And I think she made it look good but not too good that yep. you know she couldn't fly it straight yeah and yeah. and i gotta say the animation is just seamless it was spot on yeah you could kind of tell that giddy knew what was going on um and unfortunately and we've seen this for time and time and time again you know hundreds of billions of stormtroopers and they are all utterly useless and i was like yeah okay what was the point of that and that's like last week we said we predicted certain things were going to happen in this episode of course we got a couple wrong but what we definitely got right is that our heroes would just walk out without a scratch, not even a drop of sweat. They just shoot the crap out of everybody. It's a great scene. It looks good. You know, sure, they walk across the bridge and the two Mandalorians jump off with their jetpacks and whatever. And it was just like, yeah, it's just another day at the office. They go bang, 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 bang. They're all dead. So if there was a weak part of the episode, that was it. it might look good, but like nothing really happened. You know, we've got, especially with Kara and Fennec, they're standing out in the open. You think, surely they're going to get, you know, an actual bit of damage. Nothing whatsoever. And that was like, that was kind of disappointing. But, you know, it yeah. was a means to an end. So it is what it is. Uh, and of course, then Din has to do his sneaking and carrying around the whole thing in the, in the corridor, trying to find his way to uh, Grogu. And that's when he comes across the Dark Troopers. And I know what you're going to say. The Dark Troopers, they go, they look a shitload of, like Cylons, don't they? <laughs> Another Battlestar Galactica reference. <laughs> they, well, don't I was, see, I was... they just walk around and they're threatening and menacing. And once again, Katie Sackhoff would have said, hey, I've seen these guys before, but they were chrome the last time I saw them. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of, it was a mixture of Cylon and Terminator. Yeah. The way that, you know, they moved and punched you know, the walls and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, there was that one scene where he's got, you know, one gets out and Din's fighting him, which kind of, there was a couple of questions that had to be asked, yeah. you know? So they said, oh, because they talked to the, 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 the scientist guy and he said, oh, we've, we've evolved from having people inside them to being robots. Like, hang on, you've had droids for yeah. how long? Yeah, it's not you an know? evolution. So that made no sense whatsoever. Totally agree with you. Um, and then when he's, when Din's fighting him, so 
gunfire doesn't affect him. No. Being hit doesn't affect them. The armor seemed like it was Beskar. So if, right at the beginning, yeah. I thought, there's no way to beat these guys, you know, and he's punching him and the Beskar and the Beskar or yeah. the, the hand and the fist, which, you know, isn't getting destroyed. And you go, but the wall behind it is. Yeah. And you go, well, that's that's obviously not sturdy steel. Yeah, they've been making all this stuff out of uh, Captain America's shield uh, metal. That's that's for sure. And and I agree with you. I mean, there's obviously the third generation you know, droid. And it's like, yeah, as you said, it's like, oh, I've had droids before. What's the big deal with that? And of course, when, and I actually like the fact that at least Din had to fight a bit. You know, it wasn't a case of just usually they just blow these things up. There was a little bit of action involved there. And I thought, I, even I was thinking, okay, what's going to happen here? Is he going to lose an arm, a leg, or whatever? You know, bladder control, as you say. Bladder control. And, um, <laughs> Uh, and of course, that sort of didn't happen. But I mean, when the droid is bash passioning me into the helmet against the wall, and I was thinking, I would like to, I personally would love to see just a little bunk dent because, you know, these guys have obviously got a fair bit of force. And of course, we're not getting that. If anything, he's bashing his head through the wall. And I thought, yeah, you can almost argue, so, oh, best guy is the greatest thing in the universe. But by the same token, you're thinking, all right, you know, it's the immovable object and the unstoppable force scenario. There's got to be at least a scratch. You know, a mark of some description. It would have been nice rather than just saying, "Oh no, he's just standing going pow, pow, pow," and it's like, yeah, boring. But um, even, yeah, even yeah. the visor being damaged, the visor, yeah. the actual glass should have been damaged. You know, even if they had a partially crack, that would have been awesome. Yeah, totally agree with you. But uh, so you know, it was a good sequence, and of course, you know, you're thinking, "Oh, where are the rest of the guys?" And of course, once he blew them out of the airlock, I thought, "Oh." Okay, that's that's a bit of a disappointing thing, and I was kind of I was really glad they came back later on. I thought, oh well, that was a threat that's just been completely eliminated. Um, but it, look, it was a good scene; it worked well, and I've got to say that uh, was kind of kind of cool. And of course, the funny okay. thing is that in the show, Din's carrying the spear, right, which is kind of nice. Hark back to a few episodes ago, the best car spear. And I think he's given the you know the laser blasters; they've all been given the flick. Let's go old school, you know, like 18th century spears. And uh, who knew? That would actually come in handy. And it's like, <laughs> what are the chances of that? So uh, he just whips it out and is like, yeah, okay. So we're going like, you know, in a completely different way here, which is kind of groovy. I, I didn't, I didn't think the the scene with the um the the dark troopers getting shot out of space. I went, come on, guys, there's nothing, nothing's going to go wrong here because you know they can fly. They're coming back. Yeah, so I, I didn't, like, I didn't think of that. I actually thought, oh, okay, they're actually gone, gone. So when they did come back, I thought, ah. Oh, that's pretty cool. So yeah, so I must yeah. have got sucked into that one. Yeah, and then when he uses the spear, he's he's got like no training with a spear by the looks of it, no, and no. he's trying to you know jab here and thrust here. But it was nice to see that you can you get him once under the yep. under the neck sort of thing, and that sort of destroys him. It's like all right, yeah. so there are fifty others. Just walk up and do it exactly the same to the rest of them. So yeah. but no, he didn't do that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. There should have been a little bit more injury. He should have been staggering or something after yeah, being pummeled that yeah. hard. Yeah, it was good that he had – it wasn't easy for him, but by the same token, he should have at least walked away with a limp or something. It just it just needed to. And it's like – it's it, it's a pain to predict what's going to happen and then be correct about it, uh, mm. even like a bruise on the arm or something like that. It's like, yeah, but, you know. But I agree that even a swipe like Mark on the helmet or a crack on the visor, just something to say, yep, it's been – it's these guys are harder than usual. Uh, otherwise, yeah. it's just like, yeah, you just move on. Um, so we get into the, the bridge of the ship, right? And everybody gets killed. I personally, I thought, what happened to like uh, Moff Gideon's um, adjutant, the lady Imperial officer? She just gets killed, doesn't get a, like a look in at all. Uh, and like she actually had the potential of being a really interesting character because she was the only one outside of Gideon that we actually get to see sort of speak and interact with and all the rest of it. So she was just pushed aside, which was a real, real shame. And, uh, yeah, they've destroyed the bridge and got a law locked down. And, of course, you know, Gideon's not there. He's buggered off down to where Grogu is. Now, that whole sequence when Din finally gets into the um, the cell, you got Grogu, you've got the Darksaber. And it's like, this is an interesting moment. It's like, where is this going to go? And I reckon fans who were watching it at that point, I mean, they would have put two and two together and said, if oh, Gideon's going to be anywhere, he's going to be with Grogu is. But with the saber over his head and all the rest of it, you're thinking, this could end a whole lot of different ways. What is going to happen? And I thought at that moment, the show climbed a really, really high gear very quickly. And if you press pause just there and said to all the fans, what do you think is going to happen here? You'd end up with a dozen different answers. And uh, that was a really interesting, good character moment with Gideon and Din in the same room get to have a conversation. So what do you think of all that? It did step up a gear, but it could have been stepped up a gear with more more threat on the kid. You know, he was helpless. Gideon could have even put the, the saber to his body, you know, or, you know, taken a, a bit off the ear to actually really agitate yep. Yep. Uh, 
kicked in and that would have accelerated it a little bit more. It kind of was like, you know, oh, I could hurt him if I want and you're like three feet away. What are you going to do? And then the negotiation occurred. That is a very good point. And I think maybe when they were uh, looking at this sequence, they thought how far is too far? And I agree. Now, I actually thought personally that Grogu was going to do something because he's seeing this threat mm. above his head and doesn't know do anything. And you're right. If they would take out just one tiny notch and get the dark saber to touch Grogu and either you know, cut off a bit or you know, put a scar on his face or whatever, and cause freak the kid out big time. Uh, but by the same token, you would potentially argue that if he did that, then Grogu would react. And then, because you've got to remember, he's trying to restrain him. I mean, he's got the, the, the handcuffs, and I don't think the handcuffs can restrain the force capability. So if he actually did hurt him, then maybe Grogu would turn, do the whole turn up and react. And, oh, my God, and then Gideon's getting thrown around the room. But I agree with you, though. It would have taken it a step further. And I think fans... They probably thought, oh, no, the fans are going to be really upset. They're going to be like, oh, this is this is going too far now. You can't hurt the kid, yeah. right? And the kid never gets inj- injured anyway. So, But I really liked it. I thought it was a really good s- sequence. Gideon finally got to sort of portray a character and have a conversation with Din. And you can see with Din, he's like, ah, yeah, what do we do with this? How is this going to work? And when Gideon says, yes, you can take the kid and walk out the room, he's got everything he needs. And for a period of time, you're thinking, all right, <clears throat> I didn't see this one coming. But, of course, as bad guys often do, they've got to turn, you know, turn tails and, you know, completely, oh, I didn't see that one coming. He's got the saber out and he's having a bit of a bash. And the whole fight sequence, as I said, like Din's got his spear. Oh, lucky I brought that with me. Uh, I was actually kind of, kind of groovy. I thought that worked really, really well, even though Gideon clearly isn't a saber fighter. So he's obviously making stuff up as he goes along. Din isn't a spear dude. So he's making stuff up as he goes along, you think, but he's more of a combatant than uh, Gideon is. But it was a really good sequence. Uh, even though you knew how it was going to end up. But, uh, yeah, I, I really liked it. I thought it was, uh, yeah, kind of groovy. And the fact that the dark saber finally got to see some action was uh, kind of cool. What do you reckon? Yeah, that could have gone, like we said, so many different ways. But eventually, because when he said, oh, look, I got what I want from the kid, you can have him. And and the, yeah. lot, and the dark saber withdraws. You go, well, what's he up to? Because you never trust an opponent like that. You, you never turn your back on someone. So he yeah. picks up the kid in the awkward way because you don't want to see that it's a, a you know, puppet sort of thing yep. um and as he turns around then he gets attacked and and that fight scene which actually could have stayed in that room which would have been again more dynamic because it would have been more threat against the kid yeah so it could have boosted that a little bit more they go into the hallway the kid's all safe you know yep. actually thinking about it if gideon did sort of even just nick like a bit of his ear off yep. Grogu could have turned real evil and just exploded and pushed them both against the wall knocked them both out that would have been even more yeah we've sort of uh, discovered in this discussed the show and some fans have actually thought about this too whether uh grogu's on edging on the dark side a little bit and it all the time because he's obviously got a lot of power and it'll just take one little like step in the wrong direction to sort of set him off and you can just go completely psycho but imagine the fans going oh my god it's 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 dark grogu it's like yeah they wouldn't be able to handle it and, you know you suddenly have to sell all these grogu fi- action figures that are all painted black instead of green so um, so the key thing, and I thought this was really well played out, right? So Gideon's defeated. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Uh, Din walks in with the dark saber, hands it to Bo, and, and like Bo can't accept it because it hasn't been won in combat. And that, of course, Gideon says, oh, well, there you go. And of course, this, you think, sets up a showdown between Bo Katan and Din. And Din's saying, no, yeah, take it. She's, she can't. That I thought was really clever. It was really, really well done, really thought out. There's a slight problem with it, right? <laughs> As a few people have picked up on um, in Rebels. Now, if you've never watched Rebels, you've got nothing to worry about. But in Rebels, Sabine had the Darksaber and she gave it to Bo-Katan. And they, she didn't win it in combat there. So there's a mm. great continuity conflict already. But some people have then suggested that maybe if Sabine gave Bo-Katan the Darksaber... Bo-Katan, because she did not win it in combat, actually lost Mandalore, the whole, like, no one trusted her. It's like, nah, you didn't win it properly. As they discussed in this episode, unless you win it in combat, you don't have that following of saying, yes, you earned the right to have it. And maybe that's why Mandalore fell in the latter half of the Empire's rule. And now, of course, Bo-Katan, realising that, because she's obviously lost the Darksaber in her travels, now needs to get it back in combat to win the right to say, yes, I earned this. I can now rebuild the uh, the, the planet. And maybe uh, if you look underneath the surface, there's a fair bit to that. That's the reason why, especially in the eyes of all these people who are in the room with her, she won't just take the saber off uh, Din. And I thought that was really cool. And of course, by the end of the show, we actually have no idea what's happening and what happens. But we know now that Din effectively is the what they call the Manda Law, who's the, actually the ruler of Mandalore. So... 
yeah, that's a really interesting sort of conundrum because you're thinking, oh, great, here you go, pass it over, thank you, woo, got the save, good to go. No, nah, can't do it. And you could see it in Bo-Katan's eyes like, damn, <laughs> what do we do now? I wanted to take it off Gideon, but I didn't. And I thought that was really well played. That was something I don't think anybody saw coming. What do you think? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, look, I thought it was interesting because, you know, he says, she goes, I have to win the battle. And he just goes, I yield, here, take it. I, it's almost yeah. like I don't care about anything. Yeah. I just want the kid. Yeah, you know, and you could see in her in her eyes like, do you think I could take him? So there was that there was there was that thought of, can I take him? Should I take him? And what's it going to mean? Because then we were going to battle against each other, and then Moff Gideon pulls a gun and 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 starts yeah. shooting around. So um, look, to be honest, uh, Din all he had to do was turn around and go, you know what? Throw the 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 lightsaber back at Gideon. Uncuff him and go. Yeah. All right, off you go. Off nah, you because go. he had already earned he already earned the dark saber off Gideon, so it doesn't work that way. But you would think, from Bo-Katan's point of view, she'd be weighing it up and saying, "Well, okay, to ensure it from the bigger picture point of view, taking on Din would have been the most logical thing, even though it would have hated it. But if that's how the Mandalorian culture worked, and they were so aggressive anyway, it would have happened in the past with other uh, rulers." So it would have been a case of, "All right, I now have to fight this dude," and clearly he's a bit of a tough cookie. She's probably thinking, "All right." Well, if this is what it takes to get the dark saber and to get Mandalore back, so be it. Yeah, as it were, so be it, Jedi. And uh, but she would have been thinking, ah, oh, yeah, he's going to be tough to beat. So maybe that was a, an aspect of, of the story as well. But it was a good moment. Uh, and of course, mm. I thought in the show that D- Gideon was going to cark it one way or another, and they didn't. They kept him alive. So uh, to you know, obviously be tried for his crimes and all this sort of business. So I didn't see that one coming. I thought, yeah, he'd be knocked off for sure. So be very curious yeah. to see where that all. Uh, transpires but again he wasn't injured at all like no. you know even with that battle with din everyone seems to be happy it's like you you're not getting hurt here and you need to be hurt like even in in jedi leia gets shot in the arm yep you know exactly. someone gets at least slightly injured yep you totally know agree but no one's getting injured here and and yep. i think that's one slight downfall to this series yep. you know like we've seen din get hit in the arm by something else and he, he's holding his arm but here he yep. should have been like you know no, it's it's totally. like chucking a can of tuna against a wall and not yeah. having a dent. So yeah, and you you think by now they've all learned that if you're going to shoot at Mandalorians, aim for parts where the bar where the armor isn't like in the neck piece or you know, part yeah. of the legs or elbows or whatever. So anyway, it is what it is. So the Death Troopers uh, return in that sequence, and as I said, I didn't actually think they would, and I thought, oh, this is kind of groovy. They all return. They're doing their silent thing, walking through the corridors and whatever else. And when they're outside the door and they're trying to bash their way through the door. <clears throat> Even I thought it was one of those, all right, how's this going to play out? All our heroes on one side, all the bad dudes on the other side. It's like, yeah, okay, what is going to happen now? And I thought that's another moment. You pause it right there and ask all these fans, what do you think is going to happen? And uh, no, I don't. I think some people may have predicted it. Uh, I certainly didn't think of this. An X-Wing flies into the ship and it's like, oh, okay, I didn't see that one coming. Your first thought is, that, oh, is a Dave Filoni going to jump out or the other guy going to jump <laughs> yeah. out? I'm from the New Republic. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly my thought. Yeah. Because it's like a single X-Wing. Oh, this could be anyone. Yeah. You know? And you go, oh, maybe it's just Dave going, hey, guys, I'm here to tell you that we're doing season four or something. You know? <laughs> Um, so the, uh, the funny thing is when the door goes up and you see the image of Luke in the back, right? And it's exactly mirroring what we saw in Rogue One with Vader, right? It's like, like father, like son sort of scenario, right? It's standing in the distance, you know, with the hood and the smoke and they've got the saber out and all the rest of it. The funny thing, of course, is that, and that whole sequence mirrors what happened in Rogue One. Yeah, it's, it was obviously a means to an end, get to the, the bridge, open the door, big reveal, right? Take the hood off. It's like, oh my guacamole. Um, I thought it was very well done. It was really well handled. It was obviously when you do a reveal, you go, how are they going to deal with this? Are they going to deal like a de-aging? Are they going to do like deep faking? What are they going to do? What did you think of that? Look, I thought there was a couple of problems with that whole scene. Okay, mm. so the, the once he lands, all stop. Yep. That's my issue. They all stop. They should have had no reason to stop. Mm. They should have kept trying to punch through, yep. which would have created a greater threat, which would have meant that whoever came out of it had to get to them faster. Yeah, yeah, it's not clear as to what happened there. Yep. So it, it was someone said to me on on the night of dead, Oh, mm. did you guess who it was? It was like I saw a black glove and a green lightsaber. Yeah, who else it. is it gonna be? Yeah, you exactly. know, because once I saw the X-Wing, I thought, oh, maybe it's Ahsoka, maybe it's maybe yeah. they're bringing in um uh uh Mara Jade or something like that. Maybe they're doing something um really left of center. Mm. But then you sort of see that, and then the lightsaber goes through the 
the dark troopers like their butter and it's like hang yeah. on a second you know it just these things didn't seem to match up and it just it it was on the surface awesome like don't get me wrong it was a very good thing to do and it was very well done um but i think it was missing something and i don't know what it was once he gets to the to the room and he reveals i thought yeah okay i can see that what they've tried to do it looks like him from jedi but it just didn't work for me because he yeah. also looked too skinny it was it was definitely a, a body double but yeah. there was just it just didn't quite work for me unfortunately it was like um layer in in yeah. rogue, rogue one yeah. it, it was exactly like that and i thought guys you you had a chance to look even if you really wanted to just get mark to shave the beard and rock up how he is and it would have been fine but no i, I just off yeah the, off the point there. i think yeah they're just looking for an overall impact rather than saying let's i mean maybe people will like go into intricate detail later on and analyze it i mean the whole thing with the dark troopers i mean that was just okay we've got to get this through quickly right save the day get to the core part of the story you can't spend the next 30 minutes trying to bash his way through these things you're right they all just stop and he's just like slicing through butter practically but they needed to sometimes you just need to speed things up purely from a narrative point of view because we don't want to see another battle scene you know it's all well and good but i agree with you for a period of time they're thinking okay who is this is it actually luke you see the green saber the glove it could have been somebody else i thought straight away it's obviously luke um because that links back to a couple of episodes ago where grogu was on the temple and he's not he projects the thing in the into the into the sky so <clears throat> it is what it is it worked you know and he's there and it's all great and wonderful and he's the you know to the rest of the characters they go who the hell is this dude you know and we're going oh my god it's luke Scott. oh how exciting is this so the funny thing is we're going to go through the whole thing with like a grogu has now got to come around to luke r2 comes in i thought this was actually quite interesting there's two ways of interpreting this right so r2 comes in and looks at grogu they look at each other uh, people have said oh okay R2 has recognized Grogu from the Jedi Temple days, right? He says, oh, I remember this little green dude, you know, way back in you know, 40 years ago, whatever it is. How good is that? But someone else had said, yeah, R2 looks at Grogu and goes, you know what? Once upon a time, I was like the um, the cute one in this series, in this franchise, and you've taken over, you little green shit. So <laughs> that any way you want. Um, but that's been how it's been looked at. It's like, yes, uh, R2's recognized Grogu from way back when, which is kind of cool. And, of course, you can see where this is going to go. Okay, Luke's going to pick up Grogu. It's going to go. And there's a big teary moment. And you know, Grogu is picked up by Din. And there's two things that they did. One thing they did really well. And one thing they kind of screwed up on. <clears throat> Clearly, Din had to take the helmet off. You know, he's saying, oh, i got to miss you, Luke. Guy, and, all that. and it's like, dude, how freaking stupid are you? Take the bloody helmet off. <laughs> it's like that you need that contact. And I think that what they've tried to suggest is that through the entire series, Grogu has never seen Din's face. Right, and of all the episodes we've had and we've discussed, it's like why didn't Din take his bloody helmet off? And you know, when he needed to in the ship, it's just him by himself. I think it was deliberately set up as stupid as it and as illogical as it sounds for this one moment. You know, Grogu says, "Can you get the bucket off your bloody head so I can see what you look like?" And he <laughs> takes it off. Now, where's the audience? Have already seen what he looks like. So we saw it in the last episode. So you could almost argue if you could retrospect last episode and keep Din's helmet on, it would probably work better this time around. Who knew? But there's at least that contact. And I think that was actually quite important. So from Grogu's point of view, he's seeing Din's face for the first time. And that's how it was meant to be interpreted. So uh, yeah. but they did screw up that scene. And uh, But I'll get your opinion uh, of it uh, in, well, but that is in a sec. So what do you think of all that? I thought that Luke should have walked in and introduced himself and said, I'm, I'm Luke Skywalker. Skywalker. I'm here to rescue you. Did I not? <laughs> A Jedi Knight, I'm here for the child. And then the, Din should have said, this is Grogu, and introduced them. Not just, uh, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. No. Look, I know it's... it's you don't it's need that. words in a scene where it's pretty obvious. I mean, remember, from the audience's point of view, it's like, we, we don't need to be told this is Luke. We already know who Luke is. And they don't, you know, who I, they don't I know, know so, but, yeah, just, but the, the characters don't know. It's some yeah. random guy. You know, you could anyone could wield a lightsaber. You know, there's no one yeah. to say yes or no. So, but you got to look at it from the point of view of the audience. You don't want to be told something you already know about. You know, it's, it's sure the characters don't know, but who cares if they don't know? But I think that it's a wordless scene. It kind of works a bit differently. Anyway, can, sorry, keep going. Um, the fact that R2 turned up, I thought, what's the point? Like, really, look, as much as we love R2, and I don't know if it was a CG or if it was real, because he looked a little skinnier than, than he normally would, uh, and he certainly moved differently. I didn't think it was necessary to have him there at all. Fan service, dude. That's what it's like. I know, oh, I know. there he is. Look at that. More action figures. How good's that? We can sell, you know, know. Mandalorian action figures, R2D2. That's yeah. the reason why. Yeah, it's just fan service. Yeah. 
the fact that Din takes his helmet off, and this is the, the, the other point that bugged me, you see it later on, it's on the ground, but he never bent over once to put it there. He never dropped it. He never, you know, I know, but this is just me because, you know, physics. See, somebody um, would say, if you're focusing on these parts of the story, you're actually missing the core part of the story. So it's like, oh, where's the helmet going? Oh, he hasn't done this. He hasn't done this. Like, dude, mate, it, who cares? It's an emotional scene between two dudes. I know. <laughs> Focus I know. on that. So. I think it would have been far more emotional if Din had a then turned around and said, Grogu, go with him. You know, I'll miss you. And actually say his name rather than, Okay. You know, hey, buddy, hey, pal. It's yeah. just that brings a connection. The fact that he puts his hand on his face yeah. and didn't tearing up. It's like, dude, you've had like two years of this kid here. You could have taken your helmet off at any one time. I know. I know. You know? I know. Actually, at one point I thought, you know, the, the battle scene where they're, they're in there and he, and Gideon picks up the gun. I almost thought Din was going to pick his helmet off and stick it over the kid. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah, it would have protected him. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, and then when the kid eventually walks over to Luke and Luke picks him up and then they walk off, it was like, yep. yeah, okay, this, there's no like, oh, I'll call you, I'll contact you, you know. Yeah, you where know, am I going? Me, yeah, yeah, he's like, can, we should, you, can you leave a number so I can give you a ring from time to time, send you an SMS yeah. or whatever. So, and then, yeah. and then it sort of, yeah. it sort of ended and I thought, yeah, I, I thought it was a bit disappointing. It could have been a whole lot more emotional. Yeah. Uh, I think you've got to be careful about like pushing the barrow too hard and making it a bit melancholy and people going, Oh my God, it's a gush fest. You know, I think they did the best they could with what they had. It now makes all sense. As I said earlier about why he didn't take the helmet off the whole time, even though it made no sense throughout the show. And because we were very critical of that, but the bit they screwed up on, they missed it completely. And it was like, Oh damn. He didn't give the kid the ball, right? The knob from the, oh, the, the knob yeah. that he saved from the razor crest. You know, he had the spear and he had the knob. And it's like, dude, you should have given the kid the knob as a memento. I was like, hey, our time together. Missed it completely. And it was like, damn. Yeah. And I was sort of, someone had pick, picked up on that. And I go, yeah. You know, he actually kept it. He actually made a point of saving it from the razor crest, right? You see, she, here you go, kid. Here's your, here's, your knob, here's your knob. You know, when you're thinking of oh. me, just have this, have a bit of a roll around with this. And, but that, that was just like, missed it. And it was like, oh, good on you guys. Actually, well yeah. It would have been yeah. perfect if he had, a, if Luke had a had him, they had been like, you know, three feet away. And he got, oh, hang on a second. Grogu. And then the kid goes, yeah. and shows that would yep. have been awesome. Yeah, yep. I get it. Yep. Yeah. yep, completely missed it. But anyway, look, it is what it is, and it worked out well. And of course, that's then presented the question that if Luke has picked up Grogu and then buggered off back to his new Jedi Temple Academy thing, X many years later, does poor old Grogu cark it when good old Kylo Ren cracks the shits and just destroys everything? So uh, and the Knights of Ren come barreling through. So all these fans are thinking, I don't want to imagine. Grogu getting sliced and diced by the Knights of Ren because, you know, the Knights of Ren, they're, they're a bunch of tough puppies. And uh, they're going, oh, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to know about it. So um, you probably find that when uh, in uh, Force Awakens, when the temple is burning and you've got Archie there and Luke's hand on, in the background, someone's going to digitally add in the little Grogu crawling out and going, oh, I'm still here. I'm all good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it does present an interesting sort of conundrum. And, um, yeah, I think it all finished up quite well. I was actually surprised. That it's like, oh, okay, so Grogu is leaving the show. Oi, is this, this, is the, this is the character that's bringing the money and bringing in the fans, bringing in the audience, and they're going to handball him off. But, of course, then we get into the post credit scene, and that is like, oh, okay, that's leading into a completely different sort of like um, uh, avenue that no one saw coming. So we get into the post credit scene. Uh, what will eventually become the book of Boba Fett, make of that what you will. First thing, you get into Jabba's old palace, and I thought, is that Bib Fortuna? It's like, what the hell's he doing in there? Didn't he die on the sail barge? Because he's definitely on the sail barge. You see him in Jedi in a couple of shots. And it's like, and he's obviously put on weight. And, you know, you allow for that. It worked well for the character development. And I was sitting there thinking, that doesn't make sense because everybody on the sail barge died. So that means they've now got to go back and retrospect or uh, what do you call it? The retcon, all this thing about saying, oh, yeah, during the battle on the sail barge when Jabba, probably when Jabba cucks it, you know, like strangles him, he's probably said, I'm going to, I'm, I'm off. He just finds an escape hatch at the bottom and bails out. They've now got to write that in, saying that no, everybody died on the sail barge. So anyway, be that as it may, uh, Bib Fortuna is back on the in, in the throne. Boba walks in with Fennec and destroys everybody, and yada yada yada. So some people have interpreted as to what happens now. There's a school of thought. Remember, the show is called The Mandalorian. It doesn't mean it has to focus on one Mandalorian. I said this a while ago. That's why you can't call the Mandalorian as in like Din. You can't call him Mando right? You can't do that because you've now got five or six different Mandalorians running around. So if you say, oh, Mando did this, you go, which Mando are you talking about? You're talking about Bo, you're talking about Koski, you're talking about the dude is in the dunny, you're talking about Bo, but who are you talking about? So you've got to call them by their names. So the Mandalorian, the next season, conceivably 
could be a situation where they focus on Boba Fett and his stories with Fennec and Din is now pushed as a secondary character in his background because his story is effectively finished, right? He's sure he got the mm. dark saber, but whatever. And some people have thought of that or whether they're going to do two shows. Uh, the third season of Mandalorian with Din and Bo and what's going on with those guys and Boba Fett in another show. So I thought that was a very interesting way to finish. So um, what do you think of all that, man? Yeah, look, when when they when Fenny come shooting through the the palace, you went, hang on, this looks like something familiar, doesn't it? You yeah. Know, when Luke oh, and, yeah, it was intentional, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought the Gamorrean guards were looking Skinny like they legs. Had a few, once again. Few, yeah, yeah, no budget. Do any great meals? Yep. Um, which sort of is a bit weird to see them like that because you would have thought that they should have been again similar to how yep. Bib Fortuna was because you know yep. Bib's running it and there's no there's no one there's no one there actually to do anything so these guys would be standing around doing nothing so they should be you know in that sort of way um, I don't know there's all speculation is what we could say but I've got no idea what they're trying to say with the FET thing mm. but I think the story is going to now it has to sort of focus on Mandalore and what Fett's going to do. So there's got to be two stories. There you go. So any final thoughts on the Mandalorian's final episode, the rescue before we rate it in Boba Fett helmets. Now the, but there's the book of Boba Fett. Apparently apparently it's not a page turn. If you don't, if you ask Yoda. Uh, so uh, there you go. What do you reckon there? Uh, MPS? I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what they do with season three. We've got no idea. Uh, it's a year away. Um, they could rewrite and reshoot whatever they want right now. And I think it's just going to be a wait and see type of thing. Uh, look, at the end of the day, after everything that happened, um, I've got to give it only four Boba Fett helmets. I wanted to give it higher, but there were just too many little bits that just didn't quite, that could have been better. That's all I'm going to say. No, nah, fair call. Um, look, I found it was, look, it was an action-packed episode. There was a lot to look at. It was good that it was a longer episode, gave a chance to sort of like get its feet and do its thing. Um, uh, there was a huge amount of predictability, which we've discussed before with the fight scene. That was brought, really brought it uh, undone. It looked great, but he's like, oh, yeah, we know where this is going. But its strong areas were clearly in its character moments with Gideon and Fett and at the end, of course, with Luke appearing and all this. And the fans have gone completely nuts Right. And as someone once said, the moment Luke appears on screen, all the attention goes to him. Right. It, it just does. You can't get away from it. What's he what's Luke going to do? How is he going to save the day? Um, so I found like even when the Death Troopers, I was actually glad that the Death Troopers returned back to the ship. I thought, oh, this is great. This is going to be very, very cool. And of course, they didn't do anything at all. Right. They're just bashing on the door and then pew, they just shut down. It's like, what was the point of that? But it did prove that yeah, using droids is not the way to go. Oh, guys need to pay attention to this when you're in the Empire. Um, but I thought the ending was handled very, very well. Um, and I think a lot of people really dialed into that because a lot of people have invested a lot of energy and time into the show and the whole thing with Grogu and Din and, you know, they finally get to see each other and, you know, Din gets to reveal his mustache again and Grogu gets to, oh my God, this, how grouse is that? You know, you got R2 and Luke and et cetera, et cetera. So it's almost like the last few minutes is what sells the show and you can almost base everything on that. So for me, myself personally, um, the predictability part, as I said, brought it undone. So I've gone for four and a half stars because I thought, you know what? They put a lot into this. They did it really, really well. And uh, the fact that it finished on uh, on an ending that left everything so open uh, was uh, really, really, really good. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, The Mandalorian a Season 2 out of the way, done and dusted. And, of course, yeah, what's going to happen next? Holy guacamole, Din's got the Darksaber. Oh, and Bo's going, you bastard. I want that. I took it off. I want it off this guy. Now i got to take it off you. How's that going to end up? So uh, very good stuff. And the fact he doesn't even want to, I reckon, is <laughs> this is grouse. I was like, put it on eBay, dude. Sell it off, you know. <laughs> Somebody out there will want it. Uh, and it's the fact he's still got his knob. Maybe he'll actually chase after Luke and Grogu. That's the next bit. And, uh, hey, run down the corridor. Hey, you forgot your knob so um <laughs> we'll have to wait and see that could be season three and it's all very good anyway that's the end of us from this particular series so we'll come back with a bit of like maybe sometime next year to talk about uh the next uh season of mandalorian how good is that so in the interim make sure you keep on grow going on whatever that happens to be so there you go party hard and rock on and we'll see you then so bye for now bye